Hey everyone, thanks for tuning into Coral Palooza Digital 2020. I have with me now Anna Zangronis, and she is the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent for Miami Dade County. She's going to be talking with us today about some of the differences between coral bleaching and coral disease. Anna? Thanks so much, Alex. Hi everyone, thanks for having me at Coral Palooza 2020. And like Alex said, I am the extension agent for Florida Sea Grant, which is part of University of Florida IFAS Extension, and I'm based in Miami-Dade County. And my colleague, Shelly Kruger, is the Monroe County agent, and she's based in Key West. So we are here at your disposal to answer any questions and talk with you about coral, fish, sponges, whatever you like. All right, let's get started. To give a little bit of context about why we're talking about this, I wanted to give you all a little bit of an overview of the stony coral tissue loss disease event that Florida has been going through since 2014. And so um, some of you may be familiar, and if you are, I hope you learned something new. And for those of you who are not familiar, I hope that you get a better understanding of what's been going on in Florida with our corals. If you direct your attention to this map, you'll notice that it's a time lapse over the past five and a half years. And in Miami in 2014, a mysterious disease was spotted outside of the port back in, in September of that year. And if you watch the red area, it will spread to the north through the northern extent of Florida's coral reef. And it also continues over time to spread through the south throughout the Florida Keys. And currently, the boundary of this disease is around the Marquesas, which is roughly between halfway to Key West, uh, excuse me, roughly halfway from Key West to the Dry Tortugas. So we've been in this for about five and a half years now. And this is a really big deal. This has caused a lot of concern in the scientific and natural resource community because this particular disease affects about half of our 45 or so reef building stony coral species. These include a lot of the really large brain and boulder corals that give our reefs their shape and structure and function. And also it affects several of the Endangered Species Act listed corals, which is a big, big problem. And so to give you an idea of what this can look like, first it's important to point out that coral disease is natural. It's naturally occurring in any system, but it's at background levels. It's at two to three percent, that's how it's supposed to be. That's like being in a classroom in a school with 30 kids and you might have one kid who sneezes. However, this coral disease outbreak is so prevalent that in a reef system, it affects 66 to 100 percent of the corals. And what that means is that 66 to 100 percent of the corals will not only be affected by this coral, but ultimately suffer from mortality or death. And this picture here will give you a better idea of what this looks like visually. The red arrows indicate corals that are in different phases of being affected by this disease. So you can see we have maybe a dozen corals here and a great majority of them are affected and on their way to dying. This disease is so unusual that it can affect and kill corals in as little as months to even weeks. This is a time series of a brain coral, Pseudodiplorius trigosa, that was taken in the Florida Keys about three years ago. And in the image on the left, you can see that it's about 15% affected. However, by the time we get to the image on the far right, it's about 50% affected and 50% dead at this point. Unfortunately, since this has gone outside of Florida, this disease has also been confirmed throughout other locations in the Caribbean including Mexico, Belize, Puerto Rico, Turks and Caicos Islands, Dominican Republic, US Virgin Islands. There is a silver lining, however, in that Florida now has this tremendously successful disease response effort going on. So these countries and nations didn't have to start from scratch in the same way that we did. And there's already quite a bit of research available as well as treatment and intervention strategies that they have that they can try. So there is a silver lining and it's not all gloom and doom. 
the reason why I'm here today is because as snorkelers and divers, you're uniquely suited to help us expand the underwater surveillance network. And it's important to be able to do that to not only understand and be able to identify what are stony corals, but also what are the stressors that might be affecting them. And the two that we're really focusing on are coral disease and coral bleaching. And so we're gonna talk about some techniques to be able to distinguish those underwater. First, we're gonna talk about coral bleaching. This is a common name. It does not mean that the coral is actually bleached in the same way that we would bleach a pair of socks. However, thinking back to our basic coral biology, we know that corals are animals that share a symbiotic relationship with a microscopic algae called zooxanthellae. And that zooxanthellae, while they might be brown or green in their color, they reside in the coral polyp and they are what, they're what is responsible for the color of the corals that we see. And when corals become stressed, most frequently and most notably in recent history, it's due to thermal stress, warm water, the coral expels their zooxanthellae leaving behind clear tissue. And what we see, we see through the clear tissue to that white skeleton underneath. This is where we get that term of bleaching because it looks like the coral was dipped in bleach and white. Something else I wanna point out that a bleached coral is not a dead coral. However, this leaves, when the coral is bleached, it's in an extreme state of stress because it's left without its major nutrient source. The corals are able to recover if those stressors are lessened or reduced quickly enough. They are able to recover from bleaching. There are different phases or stages of bleaching. Here on the left, we have a healthy coral animal with its appropriate coloration with the zooxanthellae in its tissues. In the middle, we have the first phase of bleaching, which is called paling. And paling describes exactly what it sounds like the coral is starting to look pale. It's starting to look not quite well. All the way on the right, we have the coral that is bleached in which it has lost almost all of its zooxanthellae and we're seeing that white skeleton. Some people have asked me, Anna, you know, I see corals that are white underwater, but how do I know? We'll keep, we'll keep talking about that. One thing that's important to keep in mind, here is a coral skeleton that was collected under permit and is on loan to me from the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Please do not remove any live rock or even skeletons if you see them. When you're diving or snorkeling, one way to try to tell if a coral is bleached or is infected with disease is you should still be able to see a layer of clear tissue covering its skeleton. Now that requires you to be able to get really close and hold yourself there, which could be challenging if you're snorkeling or free diving. But if you're scuba diving, you should be able to get close enough to visually confirm the presence of clear living tissue. I really like this graphic because it gives a good visual idea of the differences between bleaching and disease, namely stony coral tissue loss disease. The image on the left shows a happy, healthy coral polyp with its zooxanthellae and its tissues. The image on the right shows as the coral starts to become stressed, this is simulating the algae, the zooxanthellae being expelled from the tissues. So you can look and see that what's left is the clear living coral tissue versus the image all the way on the right shows what happens when the coral is affected with stony coral tissue loss disease. The living tissue sloughs away and what's left behind is that bare skeleton. I really like this series of photographs. These are actually by Ken Niedermeyer, who is formerly with Coral Restoration Foundation. This is a massive coral that was photographed over time. The image on the left is the coral when it's healthy and not affected by stress. However, the photo on the right is showing the coral in its first phases of paling. And another clue that you can look for 
is that bleaching tends to be a lot more mottled and diffused. And you can really get a good idea of what that looks like in this image on the right. There are no hard edged lines or margins or borders. It's a lot more spread out. It's a lot more diffused, like someone took a sponge and was painting with a sponge painting on a wall. Moving on and talking about how to distinguish from disease, there are lots of ways to start getting an idea of whether or not a coral is being affected by a disease. And we're gonna use stony coral tissue loss disease or SCTLD as our example. This image on the left, we're gonna talk about the way that the lesions or our outward visual signs, how those can show up visually. One of the ways that SCTLD can present is with a linear lesion. And in this example, you can see that lesion or the line in the middle indicating that it started from the left and moving towards the right of the species. And the part of the coral that you see on the left has already dead. Then you have that lesion and it's moving towards the right half of the coral that still has healthy tissue. This image is showing a circular lesion. So a circle lesion that starts in the center and radiates outward like a bullseye. Then you have an irregular lesion, which is more or less exactly what it sounds like, in which the lesions are presenting themselves in ways or shapes or patterns with no real rhyme or reason. And affected corals can show with either one or even two or all of these types of patterns. It's also important to think about the width or the size of the lesion, because that's an indicator of how quickly the disease is progressing on a certain coral species. We have slow or thin margins, and these are classified as subacute, meaning the width of them is less than five centimeters. Versus fast moving or thick margins, those are margins that are wider than five centimeters. So you can see the differences between the two and note just how different they are. Something that I'd also like to point out is that this can seem really overwhelming and I encourage you please don't stress way too hard because what we're trying to do is not necessarily turn everyone into a diagnostician. Coral disease is an evolving field and a lot of these diseases can't even be 100% confirmed unless samples are taken and they're looked at in a lab. What we're trying to do is start to acclimate your eye so you can recognize signs of stress in a coral and at least get to disease versus bleaching. This is an instance in which the disease was actually referred to for quite a bit some time as white plague for the first couple of years. However, the scientific community decided that it was not accurate to give a name to a disease without an identified pathogen. So white plague is one of the diseases that can look quite a lot like stony coral tissue loss. And white plague tends to have one lesion that presents in a linear fashion like this image on the left. However, so we know the image on the left could be stony coral tissue loss disease or it could be white plague. But if you compare it to the image on the right and you note the multiple circular and irregular lesions, it's not, you can say with 99% confidence that that's stony coral tissue loss disease. I also wanna point out that in addition to these two conditions, there are about 40 or so diseases in our area, the tropical Western Atlantic that can affect corals. A handful of some of the most common include black man disease, white man disease, which is specific to the acroporid species, the staghorn and elkhorn corals. And there, were, there was an outbreak of this in the 1980s, and that was what largely is responsible for the loss of these species in the Florida Keys. We also have yellow band disease, Caribbean ciliate infection, and also natural occurrences like competition and bioerosion. And these are just a few. So they're just important to keep in mind and familiarize yourself with so you can start to, again, better acclimate your eye and understand what you're looking at. And when in doubt, I recommend take pictures. Most of us have access to some sort of camera 
There are even waterproof cases for smartphone, for smartphones that you can use. And take pictures, especially if you're able to put a, some sort of sense of scale in there. These two examples are pictures that I took featuring my beautiful left hand to give scale to the colonies that I was photographing. So in addition to these pictures, it's great to get different angles, different views, wider views to show what's going on around it because those can really help give a lot of information and help us make a determination as to what's going on. And I am certainly happy if you take pictures, send them to me and I'm happy to help you try and figure out what you're looking at. Now, the last thing I'd like to leave you with is just a little quiz of sorts, no pressure, just to think about some of these things that we've discussed and try to apply them and see what you remembered. There are three arrows pointing to three different things happening in this photograph. I want you all to try and guess what you think is happening in the top arrow. If you've guessed that the top arrow is pointing to this brown area and that's living unaffected tissue, you are correct. What about the second arrow, the middle arrow? This arrow is pointing to this white edge or white line. That is the disease margin. And you can see on this particular colony, we have at least three lesions. Finally, the arrow on the bottom is pointing at the, what's left, the dead skeleton. And the reason that dead skeleton looks yellowish green is because there is no more living tissue. And that yellowish green color is coming from algae that has already moved in and colonized on the skeleton. Great job, guys. The last thing I will say is that these are really great guides. They're fantastic for everyone, everyone in the scientific field utilizes these and they're great, wonderful reference books. They're pretty affordable and they're awesome to have in the boat for a rainy day just to get you familiar with not only your coral species, but they do go into diseases and other conditions in the back. And with that, I would like to thank Coral Restoration Foundation for hosting me. I thank you guys for putting, you know, working through this, staying safe and staying at home and please Stay in contact, reach out to me, call or email anytime. I'm happy to talk about corals, diving, dogs, whatever you like. Thanks everyone.